Please join me in welcoming Les Lavelle. Good morning. I can't say how excited I am to have a whole lot of people here this morning, um, not only because this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but also because I get that it's morning on a Sunday and that this is a, a little bit of a rough time for everybody. So I'm glad you're here. Um, let's just go ahead and dive right in. My job today for the next 20 minutes is to teach you all how to delegate like a boss. But first, I'm going to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a tiny nonprofit organization with slides that work, <laughs> with only two employees. Liz was the only campus organizer, and she had to do all the campus organizing all by herself. Then the organization grew, and suddenly Liz became a boss. She had interns and employees, and they needed things to do. For a long time, Liz only gave them really easy things to do, because she didn't want to risk the important stuff not getting done right. Then Liz planned a month-long vacation to Australia. Uh-oh. <laughs> so Liz had to let go. She taught her employees all the important things to keep the organization running, went on her vacation, and nothing exploded. <laughs> when Liz came back, everything was fine. The end. <laughs> So why do we delegate? There's a lot of very good reasons for delegation. Uh, Brendan mentioned one of the most important, um, which is actually the second on my list. The first is actually that you'll get more stuff done. You are one human being, and like it or not, there are only 24 hours a day, and like it or not, you probably should be sleeping for some of those. <laughs> I'm also gonna throw out there that uh, you are, for the most of you students, and, uh, and, and we at the Secular Student Alliance do actually believe that you should put your scholarship first. Um, you are students first and leaders second. Um, so you will get more done if you can delegate things to other people. You will not burn out. You can diversify your ideas and get more ideas and input into your projects. Identifying and training future leaders. Leadership transitions are one of the biggest reasons that SSA affiliates fail. And by delegating and identifying and training those future leaders, you can help ensure your group against the possibility of failure through a bad leadership transition. Get buy-in for the group through volunteering. Uh, people who volunteer are more likely to donate. They are more likely to uh, identify with the group and have a sense of belonging and identity belonging to your group. And therefore, you'll have more dedicated people involved. You will build sustainability for your group. Um, again, much like um, identifying and training future leaders, um, you'll build a, a bigger sustainability for your group um, through a whole lot of pieces that we'll get into in a couple of minutes. Um, the biggest one of which is that you're going to create some redundancy for your key operations. Uh, if you have one person who knows how to do something and that person gets hit by a bus, and you're going to laugh, but we have actually had leaders get hit by buses, um, this is going to make sure that your group doesn't fail because the only person who knows how to, hit the, to, how to upside, update the website has gotten hit by a bus and is in the hospital. So uh, in my practice, I break down some delegation into six steps. We'll overview them here, and then we'll go into each one in a little more detail. Get organized. Find your volunteers. Delegate your tasks. I know this seems really straightforward. Take the time to teach. Let go gently and show your appreciation. So we have six steps there. Each one of them is pretty, so, is, is pretty, is pretty simple and straightforward, um, but there are a lot of little tips and tricks on how to make it successful for you and your group. So the first one, get organized. You cannot ask people to do things uh, if you do not know what you're doing or if you haven't thought through how to do something. So by doing some prep work now, you can set yourself up and your volunteers up for success. So first, you need to identify projects and tasks that you would like to delegate. Hey, this is a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, maybe you need someone to post upcoming events to your group's Facebook group. Uh, maybe you need someone to reserve rooms for meetings or to run the occasional meeting because you might have a class that conflicts or maybe you're working on a big project and you get a little swamped. Break down large projects into more manageable tasks. We know that you're superhuman and that you can plan your next big speaker event by yourself, but chances are that the people you're delegating to are merely human and you don't want to uh, kill them with ungodly amounts of work. So for example, let's say that one of the projects you want to delegate is running your group's social media. 
That can be broken down into a few separate tasks. Posting and advertising the events on Facebook. Coming up with daily content for a Facebook wall or a Twitter feed. Blogging and posting to your group's website. If your group has a blog, which I hear somebody said was not a very good idea in a talk earlier today. There she is right there. Uh, but you've broken this down into several discrete tasks. You can actually ask a different volunteer to take on each of those separate tasks, thus making the workload a lot lighter for each person involved. Man, someday these buttons are going to work right. Come on. Do some things. There we go. <laughs> Document your process. See, and then it screwed up the other part of this. Oh, computers. This is going to help you organize yourself. You will realize that if you have a task that can or should be broken down further, uh, you will identify key information that you need to pass on, like, say, admin rights or passwords to a website. And you will prepare yourself to teach someone else to do this task. We'll talk more about teaching in just a minute. Your second step is going to be to find volunteers. This can be a challenge. It's actually one of the more common things I hear from groups. I need to get people to volunteer. I'm having trouble finding people to step up and help out with the group. A lot of groups send out a big email that says, hey, we need a volunteer to do this. Email me back if you're interested. And then they come to me and they say, Liz, I can't find anybody to do the thing. I emailed the group, and nobody wants to do it. OK, this is why I say meh. Uh, sending out a mass email asking for help is probably the least effective way to get people to help. And uh, to the extent where I almost, unless you have a really, really engaged group, I would just recommend don't even bother trying this step uh, unless you have nothing better to do with your time. Um, so what you want to do is look at your group, find a good candidate, and directly approach that person. Ask that person to help. You want to be prepared to ask them what you'd like them to do, how much time and energy it's going to take, and why you think they'd be a good fit for it. So I might say, Gordon, I would really, really love to have your help with the SSA's social media, because you really get this social media thing. You're really active on Twitter, and I think this would be a really good task for you. It's not going to take a lot of time, maybe you know, 20 minutes a day. Is that something you think you can do for us? Pretty painless, pretty straightforward. So much more effective than the mass email asking for help. I skipped some steps. Um, you want to be honest, both with the good and the bad. Um, so you, the uh, uh, good news is probably things like they'll get opportunities to bond with their other officers, opportunities to run for leadership positions, learning really valuable skills that you're going to take off into the rest of your lives, because believe it or not, there is a life after college. Um, and whatever incentives you plan for your group's volunteers. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, too. The bad news, uh, it's not really bad news per se, but be really straightforward about what you expect, how much time that it's going to take, realistically, not you know, as some hopeful underestimate that's just going to try and get them in the door. Um, if your group is in a real bind and you are desperate for help, let them know. If you say, this really needs to get done, or our group isn't going to be a registered student organization next year, um, that little bit of pressure can lean on someone and really make them realize that their help can make a big difference in the group. However, um, if uh, you need to let people, oh man, I'm really good at this. We'll back up. You want to match your volunteers to your task. You know how I asked Gordon to help out with social media because he's good at it? Uh, that's a good fit. You wouldn't want to ask me to help out with social media because I forget that social media exists, probably because I'm getting too old for it. Um, and, and so I would not be a good candidate for that. Likewise, you might not, not want to ask your most firebrandy anti-theist member to manage your group's Facebook presence, unless you're really looking to build a firebrandy anti-theist group. Um, on the flip side, someone who's an accounting major might make a really good group treasurer. Someone in marketing or graphic design might be a really good um, uh, publicity manager for your group. So there's a lot of good skill matching that goes on here. Here's what I was getting into earlier. You have to allow your potential volunteers to say no. And here's what happens if you don't. Um, you'll get someone who signs up and says, oh, yeah, well, I guess, I guess I can do that, sure. And then they don't. And suddenly, your group has no social media presence. You have no rooms reserved for that big event, and your speaker is coming tomorrow. You uh, don't have officers on the paperwork. Your paperwork doesn't get filed, and you're not a registered student group anymore. You didn't get your budget turned on, and you have no funding this year. Um, you, by in, in any world, any situation, you would rather have a potential volunteer say up front, no, I don't think I can do that. I would rather not do that than have them commit to it and drop out because they're overworked, they're not really interested, or whatever reason, people end up not doing the things that they say they're going to do. Um, you need to be a little aware of social cues here. 
Um, people hate saying no. It's really hard to say no when someone asks you to help. Um, this is partly why we uh, directly approach people one on one in the first place. Um, but as someone asking for that help, you have to be aware of that hesitation, of that, oh, mm, you know, the hems and the haws. Um, part of it may be that they just need a little more encouragement. Part of it may be that they really can't commit and they're trying to figure out how to say that without telling you no. So be prepared to give people an out. Let them say no. This process, by the way, is a really, really good way to identify and train your future officers and leaders. Because as you think about it, um, finding future leaders is really just a big delegation process. You're delegating the entire presidency to somebody else. Uh, and the last thing here, and I get this a lot, is what if your group just does not have enough people? Sometimes you need to go on a big recruitment drive to build up your membership base so that you have enough butts in seats to draw volunteers out of. If you've got 12 people who show up to, to your meetings and 20 people on Facebook, you're probably going to need more people or you're just not going to have the, 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 the mass of group that you need to be able to get people to fill those key volunteer roles. So that's OK. It's great to grow your group. Publicity is awesome. Um, and, and if you need to go out there and, and this is what gets you to go out and advertise your group and get new people in the door, great. By all means, do it. Delegating tasks. The first step of delegating tasks is to delegate one task at a time. And this applies to any task you're delegating, any time to do it. So this is sort of the, the rinse and repeat cycle of this phase, uh, because ideally, you're going to be doing it a lot. Um, especially as you're getting started, you want to delegate one task at a time. Um, or if you're working with a new volunteer. If you try to load somebody with four new tasks all at once, um, you're opening up a lot of options for confusion. Um, let's just keep it simple to start with. One thing at a time. Be clear and be specific. You need to specify who is responsible for a given task. So Gordon, not one of you people. Gordon's getting tired of being my example. He's going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you need to be specific about exactly what you're asking them to do and when it needs to be done. Every once in a while, you'll need to tell them how. Sometimes the how is not as important. If all that matters to you is that you have a stack of 100 flyers by Friday and you have 20 bucks to spend on it, then you don't care how they're doing it. But if you are working with your school's budget system to request the funding for your entire next academic year, you damn well want to be sure that they're doing it right. Now, how many of you just said to yourself, oh, well, if it's that important, I'll just do it myself. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. And the, the reason I do that is not to call you out, is to identify how common that feeling is and to make you aware of it. Because what are you going to do after you graduate? Yeah, I, <laughs> Nick made a great face there. Oh, I didn't think about that. Um, and so this is why delegation is so important. You need to get over that feeling of, oh, if it's that important, I'll just do it myself. Because other people have to learn how to do it. And the best way for them to learn to do it is while you are still there to teach them. Um, otherwise, you're just throwing them to wolves and hoping that they figure it out on their own. Question in the back. Um, and sometimes it's done training them, being prepared to work on Yes, that is correct, actually. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but I'm glad you said it. Um, so those of us who raised our hands, I know that feeling. I've been there. Um, and and, and I, I mean this with all of the love and support I can muster, get over it. <laughs> the next step of delegating is to set deadlines and remind your volunteers. Um, if you tell someone that you just need it sometime, then you have just told your volunteer that all of their schoolwork, extracurricular activities, parties, dates, beer pong, and paper airplane making sessions are more important than whatever it is you've just asked them to do. And it will never get done, because we're college students and we procrastinate, right? We know how this works. Uh, so always set a due date for jobs, even if it isn't really that important. Um, all it does is give somebody a procrastination point by which they say, oh shit, I need to get that done. <laughs> um, so once you've set that deadline, send people reminders. They don't have, you don't have to harp on them. You don't have to send them something every day, but maybe a week out the day before. And if you don't have it, the day of, and say, hey, how's it going? You know, just want to make sure that this is still on your radar. Let me know if you need help. That last part is really important. You need to keep your communication lines open. You need to, be, you need to let people know that they can ask you for help, and you need to be available to help. Uh, if you can't be available, or if it's something that you don't have the right skill set for, 
Um, for example, I am horrible with video cameras. Right? I know how to attach the video camera to the, to the tripod, and that's like the end of my experience. Um, so I can say, I don't know how to help you with this, but Jesse knows how these work. So if you have questions, please ask Jesse. Jesse is available to help you. And then make sure Jesse knows that you've told people he can, he can help them. Otherwise, Jesse will wander off. Uh, but those communication lines are very, very open. Um, if you have an open line of communication, then if a volunteer has a problem, they can come to you and, and ask you about it. If they're afraid to talk to you, if they think you're too busy, um, if you have not made it clear that you're there to help, then they may just tie, uh, you know, bottle up those problems and pretend everything's fine, and you won't find out until the day of the event and X hasn't gotten done. You're going to take time to teach. Uh, and this is something you're going to do every time you delegate a new task. Um, and this is going to take time. Um, and this is why in the step before I say delegate one task at a time. Because this step means that, at least while you're getting started, delegating tasks actually takes more time than just doing it yourself. So bear with me. Here's why you're going to do this. Remember that everyone is different and that everyone has different skill sets. So just because you can hop onto Facebook and whip up an event and invite everyone to it means that your volunteer knows how to do that as well. You may need to walk them through that process. This does not mean that they're inept or stupid or useless. They might have fantastic ideas for advertising that event once it's up there. They may have just never done it before. They may not be used to using Facebook, which comes back to this matching your volunteers to your tasks. Maybe they're not the best fit. Um, but don't write off a volunteer because they can't do something instinctually the way you do. Teaching does take time. It can be very frustrating and very tempting through this process to say, you know what, I can do this faster myself, never mind. Don't do it. Teaching is a time investment. It will take longer to teach them, but once you teach someone else to do it, they will be able to do it for the rest of the applicable time period. Um, and then that project is off of your hands, freeing up you to do other things. Now, this is where your documentation comes in handy. You can use this is, as, a, uh, as a reference through the teaching process, um, which is why way back in the Get Organized, I said document your stuff. I use four steps of teaching. Tell, show, coach, and practice. Um, tell someone. You're going to walk someone verbally through the process. Um, so whether that's a, uh, uh, you know, creating events on Facebook or, or writing up a budget, um, or, or setting up a speaker's event. You're going to talk through how that process works. Your second step is to show them. You're going to demonstrate that process, whether that be, again, setting up a Facebook event or doing a speaker's event. Your third step is coaching. They're going to take the lead. You're going to take the back seat. They're going to do it, and you're going to provide guidance and coaching as they do it so that they're doing it correctly, they're doing it with supervision, um, but they are the ones doing it. And then after that is just practice. They're going to keep doing that task over and over again. Um, and your oversight of that will come back step by step as they get more proficient at it. There is a great document on teaching skills. Um, just right there. Uh, if you want to write that down, I will, uh, that will also be up in the YouTube video once this talk gets posted. So you can, you can pull it down from there. Um, I don't have a better, I didn't think to hand it out because I'm really organized today. That whole get organized thing. <laughs> So then check in and follow up. Don't abandon your volunteers. Keep those communication lines o uh, open. And remember that people aren't always going to come to you if they have problems. It's kind of embarrassing to say, I screwed this up. And so if you check in on them and say, hey, how's it going? Is there anything I can help with? That gives them a better opportunity to come back and say, well, actually, yeah, I could use some help with this, rather than putting the burden on them of saying, hey, I, I can't figure this out and I need help. It's hard to ask for help. Um, so be, be sympathetic to that, and, and through this check-in process, make sure that they are getting the support that they need. Step five is to let go. And this is the step where, I, where you watch a project slide out of your control and let someone else take over, and you grit your teeth a lot because it's very uncomfortable. Um, I get this. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for this, and, and it's... Uh, it does get a little easier with time, but it's always there a little bit. Letting someone else take over something that you know you kind of think of as your baby um, can be challenging. Uh, and, and again, uh, this is the hard part, but you do need to get over it and, 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 and do it anyway. So the first step of this is to really let go. You need to let your volunteer learn. They are going to make mistakes. And that is part of the learning process. We learn from our mistakes. That's okay. Help them learn how to fix those mistakes. 
once you're not around anymore, because presumably you're going to graduate or something, um, not only are they going to need to know how to do things, but they're going to need to know how to fix those mistakes. So use that as part of the learning process. Don't take back projects. Uh, this is what we call a dick move. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this makes you look like a controlling asshole. And it discourages your volunteers. It's counterproductive to the learning process and sends people the message that you don't actually want or need help, that you're going to ask for help, and then you're just going to push people to the side. Don't do this. Come on. All right. Provide your, provide your coaching and guidance. If you see someone doing something in a way that's really inefficient and you have a better way to do it, provide that. But don't tell them that's how they have to do it. If they're really, really way more comfortable right-clicking on things and clicking copy and then right-clicking and clicking paste, yeah. and that's what they want to do, that's fine. You don't have to do it. You just you know, like look the other way while you're coaching them. Um, <laughs> but don't, yeah, so don't hover or micromanage this process. Um, ultimately, you're concerned with results, not whether they're right-clicking to copy and paste or using key commands. Um, and given time, your volunteers will improve. Um, they will get faster, they will get more efficient, and sometimes they'll come up with ways to do things that you never thought of, and you'll say, oh, I did not think of that. Uh, that said, do not withhold key information. And if you have a tip or a suggestion, go ahead and give it. You're there to help. You're not the police. <laughs> if you have someone volunteering who pr produces subpar work, don't let that slide. You need to let them know, gently, be nice, and either help uh, work with them to help them learn how to fix it, or give them more guidance the next time they do it. And then be willing to evaluate your own role in the failure. Did you give them enough guidance and training? Did you really give them enough guidance and training? Did you coach them effectively? Were you available to help? Did you demonstrate it and say it? Was it really clear that you were able to help? And while it shouldn't be your first conclusion, be willing to admit that sometimes your volunteer uh, this is your volunteer's way of just saying that he or she isn't really interested or able to volunteer effectively. Again, be willing to let people say no. All right. That said, make sure you are not setting an impossible bar. Your volunteer's batch of flyers might not have been as gorgeous as you would have made them, but do they get the message across in a clear, attention-getting manner? Probably good enough. Help your volunteers learn to improve over time, but don't punish them for not being perfect, and don't punish them for not being you. Remember that you had to learn too, and it took you a while to get to where you are. Pay attention to your attitude through this process. Um, delegation can be really challenging. Um, this is, this is the, the grit your teeth and groan, moan, mumble, clench your fist, pull your hair out, but do it somewhere where your volunteers can't see you. Uh, when you're talking to your volunteers, you need to be friendly, open, cheerful, supportive, and patient. They are helping you. Even though when you're teaching them, it's going to take longer and you might want to pull your hair out, um, they, are, they are doing you a favor by volunteering and, and helping you with this workload. And you're helping them. Uh, you're teaching them fantastic skills. Um, you're getting them prepared for leadership roles. Um, you are teaching them uh, by modeling how to delegate, which is a really useful skill, I hear. Um, so your attitude here can make all the difference between empowering someone and setting them up for success versus making them feel like a complete loser. And your members are going to talk to one another. It turns out we're a community and we, you know, we talk, we like each other. Um, so if you start talking poorly about a volunteer or to a volunteer, other people will find out. And very quickly you will find that no one is willing to help you with anything. Let go gently. This last one is the fun one. Show your appreciation for people. Whenever a volunteer finishes a task, thank them. If this, someone is working on an ongoing project, periodically mention how much you appreciate their help. They are giving you their time, their energy, their creativity, their skills. Thank them. Thank you. Be genuine about it. They are helping you. Sometimes you might be thinking, oh my god, it took so long for me to teach you how to do this. Ah. But they are ultimately helping you. So thank them for it. It shows that you appreciate the time that they have spent and build a positive relationship for future volunteering, which will help you get more in the long run. Consider holding a program or events to recognize your volunteers. You might have a section on your group's website, a pizza party at the end of the semester, a wall on the group office highlighting your volunteers, whatever. You might reward people who help you fold brochures or hang flyers by buying a pizza to share. You might have a group dinner for everyone who's volunteered throughout the year. 
Whatever you do, it's a way to help you show that you appreciate and value the people who can make your group successful. This is something you probably want to consider building into your budget. It's something we build into our budget at the SSA, um, sort of a staff recognition, team building thing. And you, I really encourage you to do it too. This last one is best practices on delegation. This is all the stuff that didn't really quite fit into my handy dandy six steps before, so here we go. We've got teaching and coaching take time. Do not try to delegate everything at once. You will die. <laughs> <laughs> on the flip side, don't let the text or time investment scare you away. Um, it's really important. You've got to do it sooner or later if you want your group to survive. So just be aware of it as you move forward. Learn to delegate before circumstances force you to. Do not wait until you're swamped with your senior thesis or your recital or your wedding plans or whatever else might come up. Start delegating early and you will be able to step back and focus on the other things that are going to take your time. This is extremely important if you are graduating soon, which hopefully nobody's graduating at the end of the summer. But The buck stops with you. Never blame your volunteers. It makes you, again, look like a dick. Um, ultimately, you chose your volunteers, you trained them, you gave them the teaching to do what they're going to do. If things don't go as well as you'd hoped, use it as a learning opportunity. Figure out how you can train people better or provide better support in the, in, in the next time you do it. Last but not least, never let perfect be the enemy of good enough. <laughs> If you take anything out of this talk, that is it. Never let perfect be the enemy of good enough. Good is better than perfect and not done. <laughs> Last but not least, get help. I'm Liz Liddell. I'm the director of campus organizing. You can contact me in a whole bunch of different ways. Now you can clap. <laughs> <laughs>